does make um, like an example of what what it looks like. We'll take it apart a little bit and see how it works. Um, talk about optimization, which is a really important part of deep learning, and how do you evaluate the performance of a model? Um, anyone in the room, if you have a question, raise your hand at any point. Um, if you send a question over chat, Natasha's next to me and she'll poke me and let me know there's a question. So, <clears throat> so to get started, um, all data and slide, slides presentations always require an XKCD comic. So my obligatory one. Um, so deep learning kind of falls within the realm of artificial intelligence. Um, and kind of the true challenges uh, for that, that's kind of cut of AI is solving tasks that are really easy for people to perform, uh, but hard for people to kind of describe in a formal manner. Right? So, problems that we kind of answer intuitively, they feel really automatic, like understanding spoken words, or being able to find a face in an image, um, but it's really hard to describe how you do it. We will be talking, we will, so the question is, we'll be teaching uh, deep learning with specific, specific frameworks. Um, for us, I'll talk about a couple of the frameworks, we'll throw them out there. We're not going to get too hands-on with the methods for a particular framework. Um, I'm going to stay a little bit more high level than that. So, um, for example, uh, an example of something that is really easy for humans to do. And be able to tell the difference between a cat and Batman. Good. This is these are one of the characteristics of deep learning models. The next is you know, with a deep learning model, the functions have increasing kind of complexity in the data. It's hard to do both these things at the same time. Um, the next is that we have an input vector that corresponds in some way to an output vector. So what we're trying to do when we build a deep learning model. It fit a function to a really high dimensional set of input, fe input vectors, um, where you know x here is our input, like the images, and y is the label, like whether this is a cat or not. That's kind of the output. So tasks that don't particularly involve um, associate one vector to another, um, and that would require a human kind of think through it and, it and reflect on in order to accomplish the task, for the most part, is beyond the scope of deep learning at this point. Okay. Also, being while providing a really powerful framework uh, for building uh, predictive models relies on two things. One, that there is a large data set, and two, that it's supervised. That means that all the data that you have, um, all the individual points of the data are labeled. Um, so, cat or not cat. <clears throat> if the question, sorry, is how is deep learning different than classification? So, um, what we are trying to do when we build a deep learning model like this one is, is whether something is something or not, or classify what animal it is, right? Um, can think of if you're trying to think about the scope of you know regular statistical models like logistic regression, linear regression, for the deep learning model, uh, we'll go to this a little bit. But often when you're thinking about a regular statistical predictive model, uh, you're trying to dis you're trying to build one function that you could that you apply this function on your vector of x, your cat images, um, and try to get an output. What Deep learning allow you to do are chained together of functions. So it's the method that we're um, using that's different. Let's start here a little bit because I think this will be a really great place to just kind of um, get your hands dirty. So if you have a phone with you or a tablet, use your laptop if you have to, but it'll be easier on a phone. Uh, go to quickdraw.withgoogle.com. What we're going to have you do is draw five or six things really quick and you know what it is that you're drawing. Um, <clears throat> so this is an example of an AI experiment that Google did and uses a deep learning network. So do that for a few minutes, and I'm going to come back to you, and we're going to talk through what's happening.
oh, an owner or something with you, you know, or the person next to you doesn't, just let them peek over your shoulder. So I'm going to see what's going on. And whatever six, at the end, it'll give you like a little summary. Uh, you should take a gain direct. Um, for this class, I played this game a couple times, and I'm pretty sure it makes it hard as you draw harder things as, t as time goes on. Um, at this point, I, I can no longer draw the images that it's asking me to draw. Because I, th I think it has you uh, draw the kind of difficult images as you play it a lot. Um, so at this last time it asked me to draw like a cruise ship or something, I was like, no idea how to draw. You finish like doing the five or six, whatever. Okay. Okay. So, um, for folks in the room on the on the chat, um, like, what are some things you noticed right off the bat besides that you thought it might be cheating? What? You can. Yeah. <laughs> Like terrible psychology test. Yeah. Okay. Ah, I maybe it's because I'm terrible at drawing. So this is an example. Can folks? Yeah. Um, of what happened when I was asked to draw a bottle cap, right? So a couple of things that I noticed is that it's like that to me doesn't. Mine is on the left. Does not look like a bottle cap, but I'm able to kind of guess what it is. Um. <clears throat> Sorry, um, WebEx, one second. Mm. Um, you, right at the front is a little table that has a sign up for the Y and you can get a little slip that has the password and the network there at the foot of the table. Oh. So the revelations for folks on the WebEx is like um, they drew things in a different orientation than the training images they saw for the same image, um, for the same doodle, and they were still able to kind of classify it. And that ability to look for the image, even if the image is scaled differently in a different part of the kind of, you know, canvas you're looking at, um, that's a really interesting part of deep learning. We're going to talk about that as well. Um, one of the things that this where it did like the doodle, um, but it was able to guess what it was. And part of that is that what this deep learning model is doing is not trying to uh, uh, trying to figure out what you're drawing from the universe of objects that have ever existed. It's looking for a certain number, let's say like three objects specifically, which is it's y vector. So it's y vector has, has different things that it's trying to figure out the objects. So, model cap to me looks more like a broken chart of glass. I'm trying to find a broken chart of glass. 
So it's able to tell that it's a, it's a bottle cap, right? Um, you might have also noticed that as you draw, it gets kind of more accurate at predicting what it is to a point. Uh, and that's because as drawing, you're adding more features for it to predict from. Features being things like the wiggly line under the straight line, like a curve on one side. Those things are, for the learning model, are features that it's trying to predict from. As you add more data to it, as you draw more, the predictions get more accurate. Uh, we're just scanning all over the page. Um, so I noticed, so if you look at the uh, train images on the right, those are the images that were used to build the model and have been used to build the model over time, um, some of them really don't look like bottle caps. Like the middle one, one looks like gloves. The other one looks like the sun. Um, but that variation in training images is, is really important when you are drawing, but when, when you're trying to build uh, a net. There we go. <clears throat> um, Um, there, the folks that on the, on web are asking if there are 30 particular objects that the neural net is um, is trying 30 particular objects that is trying to predict. Um, I'm actually not sure how many objects uh, objects ultimately this neural net uses. Um, my guess is it's actually a lot more than 30, um, but it is a set number of outputs that neural net has been built to predict. <clears throat> talking about this at the beginning of the class when someone asked well why isn't this just a classification problem couldn't we use regular statistical methods like logistic regression um, and sometimes that absolutely makes sense deep models are not like this perfect medical thing that will always spit out the right um, prediction. So there might be times where all you do is kind of choose a few like linear weights correctly you just have to change your data so it is something that a logistic regression model can ingest, and your predictions might be better. Um, so the only times that generally you can, you can so if we were approached with a problem uh, involved a data set, we would begin at deep learning, We'd probably begin at a simpler, more interpretable statistical model. Um, the only times you go straight to deep learning is if, it's, um, if data is an AI complete category. So that means anything like object recognition, image classification, speech detection, um, translation, things like that. Deep learning can outperform everything else. So this is a good example of um, a workflow that uses three different deep learning models. So uh, I have Google. So I uh, say, OK, Google. And oh, sorry. It just recognized my voice. <laughs> um, so if you use uh, the Google Assistant, and you tell it to open the Translate app. It's voice recognition to understand that. Um, in the Translate app, if you take a picture of text, it's using image classification in order to interpret the text. And um, then in order to do the translation, Google recently, recently moved over to using a deep learning model as well. Um, we're going to actually talk about what deep learning is. So, it's for this network that we have right here to approximate some function, which is S, right? And it's true here, a prof function S where Y equals FX. What it's doing is mapping some input X to a category Y, X being the thing you just doodled and the category Y being what object it is. So, one thing about neural nets is that that S is composed of many different functions. And each layer in our neural net is a function that applied and then the output of which is chained together, one after the other. So all those functions, all of those layers, make up our final S, the final function that we're applying on our input vector to get our output vector. So, um, <clears throat> go back a second. So what we're going to do is is drive our function, the, th the neural net, to approximate that real-world relationship between X and Y as closely as possible. Um, and 
all pre modeling, both for, with regular statistical modeling and with deep learning, include training, which means that, that the algorithm has to kind of figure out how best to use each of those layers that you gave it, each of the functions, to get that output right. Um, what that means is by adding more layers and more neurons within a layer, um, that's how you, the adding more layers allows you to have a deeper uh, work, and the deep part of deep learning comes from. Um, and as you add more layers, you also can approximate functions that are more and more complex. So you, know, you no longer can only just uh, classify an outline of a cat, you might be able to, to um, classify a more detailed, complex drawing of a cat. Right? Um, so that's where the depth comes from, and the width of a neural network is the number of neurons you have in each layer. So the other thing that is a con of neural nets is that you don't actually see the output from each of those um, layers that are in the middle, each of those hidden layers. So you actually only see the final output layer, which is a prediction for what it is that you just drew, for example. So that's why these layers are called hidden layers. Um, and so you'll often hear folks say things like, you don't actually know what's going on inside a neural net. We don't know how it came about with that came having the prediction that it did. Um, a logistic regression model is more portable in that you can tell exactly why it made the prediction it did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting question. The question was, like, is that where this issue of bias comes from? Now, one model is kind of based off this assumption of things. One, that, like, your future is going to look like your past. Um, so if you have a model that is really skewed to classify something, uh, what's a good example? That, um, Generally, Google trained on people that um, for whom English is the first language and grew up in the northeast of the United States. Um, it, it might be that, that that translation or the um, voice isn't as accurate for folks that have accent that isn't that, that accent, right? Um, now, that can be interpreted as bias, but also that the input data, the data that was used to train the model, while true, isn't representative of the universe of data. It's a lot of people that have that say the same word in lots of different ways. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a little bit tricky because um, I think when folks say bias, the assumption is that it might be a little bit on purpose, that we might be biased to the system when there already is bias in the kind of data that we have access to. Um, you might just have access to more people that are around you. You happen to be in the Northeast, and therefore everyone speaks kind of in this way. Um, <clears throat> that said, there are ways to tune a model, um, the way you change hyperparameters and things like that to make a model give you the output you want. I uh, think we have to do to make a little more accurate, but that is also a point at which you can inject kind of your own human uh, weirdness as well. Yeah. So, um, yes. We have two questions. First of all, does the different data do different data sets have different currents for the neural network? Mm -hmm. So um, we are going to talk through one, uh, the different kind of architectures for the neural network, and we're also going to talk through kernels or filters or feature maps. There's so many different ways to say this exact same term um, in, in our example. So we'll kind of go over that. Great. The other question is, in, in these diagrams regarding the rows and columns, which are the layers and which are the neurons? Oh, yeah. So if we just all the vector, that X, that row of um, nodes, neurons that you see, the image went out again. Um, our, um, that's our, our kind of the data that we're providing to our neural net. Um, don't think of this as row and columns. Think of this as like a set of data that we're passing through a network, right? So then our second kind of uh, first function, uh, first layer, hidden layer of the neural net, all data passed through that, then is changed, passed through the second function, third function, 
So each of those layers and then pass to the output layer. So think of layers, but don't think of it as tabular data. And we we'll need to visualize that when we get to the image classification uh, example as well. <clears throat> I'm going to deep, deep a little bit on one part of neural net. Um, so each one of these neurons, the, what looks like nodes in diagram, is a sigmoid neuron. And most of the time, that's kind of what's used in as the model in most um, on neural networks. And what this neuron does is take inputs from each of the other neurons in the previous layer, whether it's the input layer or the pre hidden layer, and those inputs are a value between 0 and 1. And each of those inputs has a weight and a bias to it. Um, and a value between 0 and 1 and passes that to the next layer. Right? What we're doing is trying to see whether things meet, meet activation thresholds or um, they are the kind of the largest value we have from our neurons and then pass it on to the next, next layer. Um, uh, for if like a brain and neurons come in, um, I find that a really confusing thing generally, except for when you're looking at just like one of the neurons on its own. Yeah. So could you say for the In a, let's say, we'll talk, we'll go into this more detail, but let's say that one layer of neural net is looking for um, the three lines that people really tend to draw when they draw cats for the whiskers, right? Um, and it's like looking in a specific read for that. And for most of the image, that's not something you can find except for perhaps once in one part of the image. Uh, that activation of a neuron is something that you would pass from one layer to the next as like, like this is the presence of this feature that we know that we generally associate with cats. Um, every time these uh, neurons, the signal is passed from one layer to another, that signal has a weight, which is where our uh, weights and biases come in. Does that make sense? Online is so we would need another layer to convert an image into the five inputs on the left. The example. Um, so in this example, we move from the left to the right. We're moving from input to each of the layers to the output. But we'll talk about one example where we don't always we'll, don't follow that rule. Yeah. about the types of neural nets because generally you want to put, kind of choose your general care category for your model based on what kind of data you have. So um, feed forward neural nets. Um, they're called multi-layer perceptrons, MLPs. These are kind of the quintessential deep learning models. If you go try building your own model using a tutorial, it will, it will probably be a deep um, a feed forward neural net. And it's called feed forward because information flows through the function, so from the x to all of those intermediate computations in each layer used to define the func the f, and then to the output y. So no feedback um, connections where the output from the model is kind of fed back into itself. Um, when that does happen, we do have those feed forward neural networks are extended to include this feedback from output. Um, that's a recurrent neural net. And this is another kind of architecture. So recurrent neural nets, um, there when you extend the multiples to include feedback, and they're really specialized for um, processing sequence of values. The values where you have um, some order in which, they, in, which you, in which they are stored, in which they make sense. Um, so it's really great for natural language processing and for kind of just like temporal sequences um, of time series data, for example. Neural, neural nets. Uh, they're perfect for uh, recognizing kind of a grid of values. Since it's really great for image classification because you need to see all of your input data as a grid. Um, so it's great for image recognition and, and <clears throat> that this convolutional neural net uh, takes into account kind of a function where it looks at the input you're giving it a small number of the neighboring members of the input. So if you're looking at one pixel 
of it isn't just treat that one pixel individually and assume it's independent from the rest. It looks at one pixel and the surrounding pixel. Let's talk about this really briefly. I considered whether we should look at a specific framework, um, but it's so easy to get caught up in the um, in the syntax of one framework for deep learning um, and assume that that somehow is representative of kind of like the deep learning concepts. So I'm going to be at the like, level we're talking about like the driving cons for deep learning but there are a lot of really good frameworks out there um so cafe i've used for image recognition before uh, tensorflow is the google one that's very very popular um you can choose which framework to use based on what language you're comfortable with so if you are really comfortable in python a bunch of them support um building models in that framework using that language some of them have just command line interfaces. So I don't expect you to know any other languages. You just kind of have to learn their syntax for you know building a model um, and then do it that way. I think at the end of this, that is a really great link of all the frameworks, what languages they support. Um, think about that. So that'll end. This is a good stopping point for this before we dump, jump into like what each of our layers are. So if anyone wants to grab water or anything like that, now's the time. Okay. So to move on to an example, because all talking about all this in abstract, super difficult and sounds a little nebulous. So um, we're going to go through an example that is actually pretty ubiquitous um, whenever you're looking at building deep learning models. Um, it's images of handwritten digits uh, called the MNIST. Um, it's a modified NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology data set, that is images of handwritten numbers. Um, and they are appropriately labeled so that you, you know, someone wrote an eight and you can see it's labeled as an eight. Um, <clears throat> so it is about each been kind of rescaled, centered, and they, so they did some pro image processing in order to make the neural net perform better. Um, each image is about 28 pixels, is 28 pixels by 28 pixels. Pixels. So, what we're trying to do is do image classification, right? We want to see each image. We want to be able to tell what number was written, what a number was actually written for each image. Um, and to do that, we're going to build a convolutional neural net because, because we discussed for image classification, scenes are really great. So, to build this deep learning model, what we wanted to be able to do is accurately label handwritten images and classify it as an image of a number between 0 and 9. 20,000 images in this data set. Um, and each of these images has a label indicating what number is actually written on there. And I do with a lot of um, kind of learning, uh, pretty modeling, we're going to split our data set into the data set, the validation data set, and the test data set. Um, we're gonna, from 80,000 images, use 55,000 images for training the data, which means this is what the model is actually built on. Uh, this is how um, it the, originally kind of defines what ha happens in each function, what happens in each layer, um, and how it can get close to get it to predicting the output accurately. Um, the validation, kind of the performance of the model, evaluated while it's training. This is the validation and test set for that. Um, since convolutional neural nets have feedback, um, as the model is learning, um, if it gets that, if it gets the prediction wrong, that's something that the valid you, you you test on the validation test set. Uh, and again, validation test set is like entirely separate from the one that was actually used to train on. And finally, at the very end, we have our test data set, and that's a data set that you don't touch until your model is entirely built. It's in the final form, run it on the test set to see how what actually performs, how it gets. Um, in learning in general, we need, it's really essential we have that be separate um, and that we don't use the data set that we use to learn and to build a model to test our model. It's not an accurate representation of how well that model generalizes. Um, the model generalizes, what I mean is a model has a really, really low error rate when you use your uh, training data on it, when you test it on training data, 
buzz a really high error rate when you some new handwritten images. Um, that means your model doesn't generalize well and it's overfit to predict only using the data that you've given it. So each of the layers in this weird gram of convolutional neural net. So really common uh, layers involved in, in a CNN are the convolutional layer, the pooling layer, and the fully connected layer. Um, the order of these layers matter, uh, and it includes the same layers multiple times in a net. So this is kind of the most simple, straightforward architecture that you could set up, um, but you would play with this architecture, what it look like, and try to like build a better model. <clears throat> convolutional layer. So this is where the power of the um, convolutional neural net comes from because it's so great for image classification. So it takes advantage of that spatial structure of the image. So and it's that by using local receptive fields. A local receptive field, um, it, for a given neuron in the layer, which is what the blue dot is there, it's connected to a small region in the input layers. In this instance, five pixels by five pixels. Every, um, each neuron in our hidden, in our very first hidden layer in the convolutional layer, um, has a five by five pixel um, low receptive field that slides over. One should be varying numbers, but let's just say one. Um, and then the next neuron comes from the next five by five. So that when until ultimately you uh, you end up having twenty four neurons, which Makes sense when you think of a slider going across the image like that, right? One has um, um, each one's connections has a learned weight and an overall bias. Um, so what that might look like? And those weights, one of those connections, visually, where um, a larger weight means that you have a darker pixel. You might see something like this. And this is kind of as close as you could get to getting a sense of what's happening in a hidden layer. In our instance, a hidden uh, a weight with a darker pixel, actually might, you could interpret that as um, kind of this, this part over my mouse. Yeah. This here um, on a four, right? So the thing is that those weights, that bias um, at that neuron level is shared across all 24 by 24 neurons. So what that means is that when the building the map from the input layer to the hidden layer, kind of a feature. Sorry, one second. So sharing the weights and bias. For every single one of the 24 by 24 neurons, uh, you end up building a map that sometimes we call a filter, sometimes we call a kernel, but I like to think of it as a feature map because you can think of it as detecting one feature in the image. So um, maybe like a particular kind of curve or a cross, right? A very local feature, a localized feature within the image. So, of course, detecting one curve. Uh, for all of your images is not going to be particularly helpful. So usually, um, a convolutional network will include 20, like 3, 6, 20, 40 feet maps uh, that it is detecting various kinds of localized features and putting them together in order to make its prediction. So we have, you know, let's say 20 of these feature maps, each of, one, each of which of one um, is looking for a particular kind of feature in your image. Image, um, you would have a pooling layer, and pooling layers are usually always used right after the convolutional layer. layer is, is simplifies the information in its in the output from the convolutional layer. So um, a really common method is the max pooling. Um, is max pooling, and so what this does is take now two by two from our convolutional uh, neural net from our convolutional sorry layer, and condense that into one neuron. And all that, neuron say, all that neuron has is the maximum activation for that region. So if um, our, our feature map is looking for a particular curve, 
and this um, really doesn't have that curve um, in you know in image, then that that ultimate cooler neuron will be activated, right? So we're having from the 24 by 24 neurons that reduce to 12 by 12 neurons. Um, basically thing that says, hey, given the feature map that we're talking about from one of your 20 feature maps, did you find that feature anywhere on this image? Um, and it kind of throws away the locational information about what that feature is found. So if a curve is looking for and it's found for this one image, it says, okay, that, that, that it was activated at some point. That feature is in there, but it doesn't really tell you where it is. We kind of have information. So our final layer um, is a called connected layer. Um, and what this does, every neuron in our max pool layer connects it to um, one of the 10 output neurons. So, um, each of the 10 output neurons has an activation value for um, each image. So, if you, so for an image that is through our neural net, if the one that represents the output neuron that represents six has the highest activation value, then that predicts that that image is six. If you remember the doodle classifier thing, it told you um, if you looked at what it probably pre predicted the doodle. It also said what the second and third prediction might have been, and you could see how those might have been similar. Um, that example of like where of where the activation value wasn't the highest for one of the other output neurons. Um, but it came in second or third, right? So like this very weird um, growing and shrinking neuron set. Um, what we started with is what we what we're going to run through our neural net is one image of 28 by 28 pixels. Um, we look for 20 different feature maps um, that one image. Um, looking at five by five, five pixel segments, um, each one of our neuro, um, feature maps. The layer for each feature map basically says, hey, was that feature found? Yes or no. Um, and we have a fully connected layer that allows you to make a prediction on what um, output on that image is related to, right? What actual prediction for what's written there. The model that can be used, um, each image at actually near human performance. Um, so for even like kind of the really simple ones that Three, layer, three hidden layer uh, convolutional neural net. It guesses it right 99% of the time. Um, and these are examples of uh, some of the misclassifications, which generally to me feel, feel kind of fair. Like one could be a seven or, or a one. And like as a human, I can't actually tell which one it was. Um, say seven or, or two. And, um, but, uh, um, <clears throat> most data that you're the neural net that you're trying to predict might uh, trying to build might have a data set that is similar to one that's already been built or might be entirely new, and so it's actually really helpful to go back and understand each of the algorithms that uh, that go into building a neural net. So like how um, the stochastic gradient descent algorithm, which is the weights and kind of the biases that go into each one of those, um, how that works. How does the back propagation algorithm uh, work so that what that does is compute the gradient of our cost function. Like how how badly are we kind of getting it wrong in our validation test set, and how does it go back and relearn those those parts? Um, because the only way that's really the only way that you can um, prove a neural network learn, right? By changing these parameters that are part of these larger algorithms that drive your neural net. So, um, right, um, are to allow you, are a couple of hyperparameters includes like what's L1, L2 regular regularization, um, and what they do generally is uh, allow you to make, make your network better generalizing beyond the training data set. Right, you're not overfitting. Uh, part of that regularization method might include artificially kind of expand your training data set for adding more variance when there isn't enough. Our tweak and optimize include the methods for initializing the weights in your network, um, and also 
Very first question. Yes. <laughs> Just about last slide was the lower number for each of the second decision or the actual ground truth digit. I believe the top number was the ground truth, and the um, the prediction was at the bottom. So um, <clears throat> there are also heuristics that kind of help you find good hyperparameters. So um, hyperparameters are things like the learning rate or the regularization parameter that I just talked about. And um, of course, doing it manually is an option. Um, but I kind of like to think of it as, as like writers on a soundboard, if I turn to the things on the soundboard. Like, yeah. um, so most deep learning algorithms kind of come with hyperparameters, and what those do control a lot of the aspects of the algorithm's behavior. So what I do with these hyperparameters is it affects the time it takes to run the model, um, kind of memory it consumes, so the, the cost of, of building the computational cost of running it, and it also affects the quality of the model, right? So it looks at, um, it affects how well your predictions actually turn out, which is what you're hoping to do. Um, manually kind of choosing those hyperparameters means understanding both what those hyperparameters do, how they interact, um, and how they play into your algorithms. That's a bit hard to do, especially when we're talking about many hyperparameters between multiple algorithms that are interacting. Um, that's a place to get to. Some folks have tried originally to do is choose the hyperparameter somewhat automatically, right? So um, our automatic hyperparameter selection generally um, tries all the different va values of hyperparameters that you can um, define algorithms, um, and that you know makes it so you don't actually have to understand the ideas behind it to some extent. Um, but those are superly computationally complex, right? You are trying out every single value from one hyperparameter against each value of another, against each value of another. Um, how stable are the internal coefficients of the neural network? Do I get the same or similar coefficients if I present the training data in a different order? I divide the training data in two and run the training on one half and then the other? So ideally, if you are, I'm going to answer the last part of that um, first. Um, ideally, if you are randomly training data, your data set into training and validation and test, that should not affect your model's performance. Um, the other part of that question was how stable are coefficients um, if, if I present the data in a different order. So if, um, each image in your um, each image that you're trying to classify in the neural net in an order that should not that that will not affect the robustness of your neural net. If you change the order of each of the pixels in your image and present that differently, that would completely wreck your net because this neural net is specialized to look at one pixel and all the surrounding pixels. So that context is superbly important. You would expect if somebody scrambled the pixels of the and digit and told you to and you to um, predict what it is. Question is, mm -hmm. what is the best ratio to choose for training, validation, and test data in a neural network? That's the iffy question. Um, so you want to have as much of your data dedicated to training as possible. You also want to make sure that the test data set that you have is big enough that it isn't so tiny that you are actually getting a really skewed sense of how accurate your model is. Um, people can like throw around thresholds of like 70, 30 and things like that. Um, in reality, if you really, if you're, it depends on the size of your data set. If you don't have enough um, training data, it might mean dedicating more of your data to training or expanding it artificially. Um, so what I'm going to say, I'm not. I'm definitely not going to define numbers. Anything else? To the earlier question about the stability of coefficients, uh, he says not performance remaining the same, but the internal parameters. Um, the hyperparameters that the parameters that you can define in a neural net great affect the outcome, which is why 
um, out of the art and the power from our from building deep learning networks comes from optimization. So, um, for example, for learning rate, there are a couple of different ways you can set up your learning rate. You can have one learning rate throughout your deep learning model, um, throughout every single iteration where it's going through all the data. Um, other is to have that slowly decrease over time so that the decisions made earlier have more impact than the decisions made later. And another is to have like a step. So, it, like, you know, the learning rate falls kind of um, gradually, but kind of suddenly. Uh, between epochs, between uh, ingesting data. So they have a very, very large impact. Um, but we can get uh, so, oh. Sorry, This is what I was going over. Search. Uh, briefly, we talked about using this kind of audit hyperparameter selection algorithm. So you try to figure out uh, what are the best kind of optimal results you can get by combining all these different values for hyperparameters? Uh, another way to do grid search. Uh, so what you'd be doing is, is looking at performance of explore, uh, looking at performance by looking at a really finite set of values for each hyperparameter. So or upper and lower limits on your uh, hyperparameters. Perform the grid search. We have the set of values that we want to explore for each hyperparameter. Uh, and the searching algorithm kind of trains for every joint, um, every joint hyperparameter. So you're getting like, the Cartesian product of those things, right? Uh, but instead of doing this grid search, uh, a deviation on it that uh, seems very promising is doing more uh, doing random search. Slightly less computationally intensive, it converts faster, and what it does is it defines a marginal distribution for each hyperparameter. You're not just saying here's your upper and lower uh, limits. Um, you're actually kind of defining a distribution. So, um, the good, I like this visual because it kind of defines um, what thing the two might look like. So if you search, you might look at set intervals uh, for each for each hyperparameter versus um, for a random search, you're looking at values use the hyperparameter based on the decision you gave it, right? And the data model is not learning from additional input? Yeah, so um, is actually a method we, you, would, you would implement. Um, at some point, your error rate hits, hits minimum, wholly not like a local minimum, like an absolute like larger minimum. And is where you would just know value and continuing to learn. And so you're early stopping to stop it from um, iterating through the data. So parameter that gets defined uh, when you model and is something that would affect your output. Um, Somebody asked what the, the parameters are. There are a lot, a lot of parameters. Uh, so, um, right, like all the regularization methods, dropout, uh, which is the regularization method, the learning, uh, learning momentum, like there are a lot of individual parameters that you can tweak for all for the algorithms that go into a deep learning um, model. So the place you would start is not uh, trying to tweak every single parameter. Uh, there are parameters that went when the model for image classification or um, recognition are more effective. And that's where you kind of have to like build off the existing neural nets that are out there. You wouldn't ever start from entirely from scratch. Where we have this model, um, we have, we have, we build using the uh, training data set is the validation data set to see how it was uh, forming during training. Um, but when you ultimately evaluate form the model, you're using the test data set that you set aside um, that it's never seen before. A really obvious way to test how your model is doing is to look at the error rate. Uh, so uh, that's the neural nets that have been built out there. Uh, they can have error rates, or um, they can have uh, predict accuracies of like 99.67%, right? Um, but it never really can get to zero. And so is that even if you have infinite training data and you're able to kind of recover like the true probably distribution, um, because it would be really, you would not be able to get to zero. One. 
because your input feature, features may not actually contain complete information to help you predict your output variable. Um, like one of those pens that look like they ran out for one of the numbers, right? And like um, you may have enough information. Also because you're intrinsically stochastic, right? And there's stochasticity in these systems. You would not be able to predict. Um, and also in real world, you are limited by a finite amount of training data. There's a limit to how much training data you can get um, because at some point you would have to get all the data about this thing that in its absoluteness, which is not possible. So someone asked, what's the difference between validating data and testing data? Yeah. So um, there are building as your model is learning, um, performance of your model is evaluated during your learning process. And that's where you use your validation test set. The, the test data set is thing you only run the model once your model is kind of finalized and done and do what the final performance of your model looks like. Um, um, go to this kind of supposition that um, there, you cannot get a zero error rate. Um, at some point, you do have to decide what an acceptable error rate is. And there are a couple of different ways you can pick that. Uh, one is then likely based off previous experiments, like benchmarks set by other people that have done builds previous build on that that are doing something doing doing something similar to what you're trying to do. Uh, the other is kind of makes me that if, if you just have to decide what is safe or what is cost effective or appealing to the, your consumer, right? So a good example of that. There's an acceptable rate of um, detect a particular disease, and if the rate goes above that, more than likely your algorithm is not going to be used in medical settings. Um, on the other hand, uh, you want to use the error rate on its own, but instead use kind of just the false positive or false negative rate. And instances where you might do that are your sister. If you had a deep learning net taking your email and putting spam in a folder um, might be much more acceptable to you as a to get spam in your inbox than have a piece of from your inbox go to the spam and you never see it. So that's one where a false positive where we're trying to detect spam is super unacceptable. Um, and you wouldn't just look at the error rates because maybe you just don't get a lot of spam, um, but you look at your false positive rates. Another method to use to evaluate your model is precision and recall. So we had a model that tried to detect really rare events, like um, these that only like one in a million people have. That kind of model, precision is kind of the, the fraction of detections recorded in the model that was actually correct. And recall is the fraction of the true events that were actually detected, right? Um, and so, uh, like, if you had a detector that said no one has the disease because it's, it's a rare disease, but your entire neural net says, nope, no one at all has the disease, a perfect position, but zero recall, right? Because the recall is a fraction of true events that it actually detected. Um, and the same is true. So if you had a detector that said everyone has the disease, you have a perfect recall, but decision would be you know, zero, 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 one, like that full rate of your um, rare event. So, um, recall is a really good way to look at some of this really rare that in your population data set anyway when looking at your rate of your model. We talked about this a little bit, right? Like uh, this, this slide set has a bunch of tutorials and resources in it. And I would say that if you're not starting to build uh, neural networks, and task is at all similar, something that has previously been studied, um, it's really, I would say it'd do you well to first copy that model, that algorithm, and see what has worked well on that. Uh, so in it, the ImageNet, convolutional network trained on the ImageNet for uh, computer vision tasks for ImageNet, um, that model that folks often use on their own images um, wasn't built using necessarily the training images um, folks are using it on. So copying a trained model, 
um, tweaking and kind of using optimization to to build your data set is a really good method and totally fine to stand on the shoulders of giants for that stuff. So at the end of this, um, send we'll make sure everyone has the slides and also uh, the the like the everything because I slide deck that was emailed out. Maybe the links aren't always working. So do you have any questions? It's rec yeah. recognition mm -hmm. issue. Um, could you go a little more detail on what it is you're looking for when you when you take drag the window over the pixels? Are you looking for let's say take a, a simple one for me is the the letter one? You're looking for a pattern. You're looking for a vertical shape. So you're checking the slopes of whatever if. A, if you have a dark pixel here, mm -hmm. the dark slope pixel, you know, mm -hmm. you're saying, well, that's an upward, it's an upward sloping line versus a vertical line. Or, could you go to tell sure. a, a little more about how that works? Sure. So um, <clears throat> one thing, I'll start saying that um, each of the features is looking for are um, on a smaller scale, right? On a on a very localized scale. So it would be hard to have a feature tester that was, you know, a, a straight line across the whole image. Because looking at five pixels by five pixels, and that is another example of a parameter you would play with the size of your local receptive field based on what kind of image you have and how many pixels are your image in totality. Um, so, an example of features looking for so is um, a complete conventional layer that has 20 feature maps would look like. So, one of these boxes on the right. The output from it is what the local receptive field is looking for from one feature map. If you look at the top left, uh, it looks like a, a like a diagonal line, and, and really that's all we can tell from it. Um, that is the feature that that one feature map is looking for throughout. Um, it is generally pretty hard to interpret a uh, feature it's looking for because our image is black and white, but if it were color, we would have a feature map that looked at the red spectrum, the green, and the blue as well. Right? And it kind of like grows pretty fast, and it's hard to tell what it is that each feature map is looking for. So, um, the way you would tune the number of feature maps you have um, built into your model wouldn't be to look at what each local, uh, each local receptor receptive um, field is looking for, it would be to actually look at your final output and see how well it's doing and seeing if changing that, the feature maps has an impact on your um, performance or not. Looking online, is that 20 a hyperparameter or just arbitrary for the example? This was um, the 20 feature maps um, in the convolutional kind of is a, a, a really common set for your convolutional layer um, in one of the tutorials, but they also have uh, the net one, I think uses three or six feature maps, um, go up to 40, the you set, you define your, your own net. With vector rather than roster. Input. So um, this is where we go back to, you know, architecture of your neural net is based on what your uh, data looks like. So if you just have a vector, sorry, that is, um, um, so you do a vector, and each of the values in it are um, a temporal sequence. They're not they're not images or anything like that. You might just use a feed forward, ner feed forward um, architecture rather than a convolutional neural net. Any other? All right, for a little bit and answer questions and talk to folks if they're interested in. Um, no, they already have. Um, but thank you much for having us.
Oh, I can don't know. Yeah, but no. Oh, no. I hear it. I just want to say thank you to everyone who came to the class in person and online today. Um, just a quick reminder to be sure and sign in if you're in person so we can give you credit on your transcript in the CLC for to our class and plenty of if, if people have them. So, yeah. So, uh, oh, good question. So, on the 24th of January is our next class. It will be taught by General Assembly. And it's Introduction to Object-Oriented Programming. It's a class we had originally scheduled for October. We had to reschedule. Uh, so be sure and sign up for that. There's plenty of room still left in the class. Great. And, and um, in February, we, have, we haven't announced this officially yet, but we have uh, an intro to user experience design. And we also have JavaScript 2, which is a follow-on to the class we did in. in September. So, anyway, but we're announcing that on broadcast emails too. But yes. Oh, we could certainly look into doing that. We, I, I'm building up the winter semester, and and we're we're always open to suggestions. So if you have some suggestions for a class you'd like to see us teach, just send an email to dataacademy at doc.gov, and we'll be happy to consider. A shopping session is an awesome idea too. Okay, great. Yeah, we'll we'll definitely consider uh, some other sort of possible formats. Um, yeah, there are people in the room that would be interested in a workshop type session. If, I mean. We, some, are some people already working in this field that would, okay, can you, uh, maybe the, on the in the back, just give a list of your email addresses so we can sort of have a subgroup, because um, I don't want to bother everybody. But anyone online is also interested in doing a workshop type class, um, please email me at dataacademy at dlc.gov and let me know, and we'll keep you on that short list for I think that would be more specialized. So great, great suggestions. Any others or any questions? Yes. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> No, no, it's a fair enough question. I, I'll I'll research that and get back to you. Um, do we send me? Well, yeah, yeah. If you mind send me an email, then it's easier for me to track and respond back to you. Thanks. Anything? Great. Thank you for everyone for coming.